Thank you. I tell you before, uh, Marco de Rio is uh, sick, and Luca Trampolini, uh, Trampolin, sorry, um, will write a paper of uh, Marco. No, uh, actually, I will not r uh, read the papers because um, I'm afraid it's too, it is too long. And uh, in order to be very um, close to the conclusion uh, raised by Zveva, I would like to, to, to select some, some aspects from the paper. And uh, I, will, I will decide to begin from the end of the paper, but I need one minute to find out the, the, the presentation. Dov'è? Questo? Questo qua? Questo? Questo qua sotto. Ah. Apri questo. Questo. No, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, so, so this is uh, me, um, I mean Marco Deriu. Uh, uh, he works at the University of Parma and he is involved also in the um, man organization called Maschile Plurale. Okay, I would, I would like to start from the last slide because in, in the interpretation given by Marco, um, he writes that, okay, as far as we know, the current state of research suggests that the change in the involvement of fathers in domestic care and in domestic work, um, the change lies more indeed in emotional and affective dimension than in education, more in education than in uh, routine assistance, more in routine assistance than in sharing of domestic work. Oh, sorry. Uh, so his point is that the involvement of fathers in domestic work is a matter of um, selecting some kinds of activities which are, which are performed by fathers and at the same time avoiding other kinds of activities. And uh, so he sees the um, uh, involvement of fathers in domestic care as a clear example of a selective process, which is at the same time an ambivalent process, just like, uh, as Veva said two minutes ago. So I would like to show you the sample of the population involved by Marco in his long research no he okay um, between two, 2014 and, two and 2015 he carried out several uh, cycles of meetings with groups of fathers uh, in their 30s and in their 40s in five different cities of the Emilia Romagna region in Italy not far from here and on the whole, he, he succeeded in involving 100 of fathers, which is a big sample of fathers, and roughly 30 women as mothers or as educators. So we have a big sample of 130 persons. 100 is composed by fathers and 30 are uh, women as mothers. And uh, his research is about the comparison between the fathers and their fathers, the comparison between fathers and mothers, and the comparison between fathers and their children. So the research is very rich, but we don't have time to go through that. So uh, the papers select uh, two aspects. Uh, the first one is the confrontation, uh, the comparison, sorry, the comparison between the new father and the old father. And uh, what is important to say is that at the beginning of 
the meetings that um, Marco had with those kind of fathers, uh, Marco always asked to the fathers to say if they saw more similarities and continuity with the, with the model of fatherhood of their fathers, of, or rather, if they see stronger differences and discontinuities with them. And uh, of course, they highlighted uh, differences, more differences than uh, similarities. And the most important differences are related with um, the emotional work, the emotional dimension of taking care of the children. So at, at, at the beginning, the new fathers are describing the model of the old fathers that they know. So the model of the old fathers that they would like to distance themselves to is about uh, a paternal figure that is largely absent, that is absorbed by work. He's always working. Or when he is present, he's present only in very limited moments, such as in the evenings or in Sundays. And uh, they talk about a very author author authoritarian model of father with a severe model of education. And what they claim if in, in comparison with this model of fatherhood, is that they try to be less authoritarian, of course, and more emotionally, emotionally involved in the education of their children. So it's about not being authoritarian and about being really emotionally involved. What they seek is a space for dubs, uh, dubbi, dubs. And what they seek is, is a place to admit that they have emotions, they have feelings. And a space for admitting weaknesses. They don't know how to perform their role of fathers. They don't know how to deal with the emotional dimension. And they have to understand that. And in order to understand that, they need a space. They need um, possibilities of understanding, of, of thinking, and possibilities of admitting that they are weak. They don't know how to perform their role of fathers. And one of the most important um, things, aspect that Marco uh, highlights is the involvement of the body in the educational work with their children. They play with the body. And that's very important as long as uh, the relationship of the new fathers with their fathers have never involved the use of the body. Some fathers have admitted that they had never seen their father naked, for example. On the contrary, they have told that they usually take the bath together with the children. And uh, this is a kind of opportunity for game and an, an opportunity of questioning the bodies and, in fact, a first approach to, uh, towards sexual education. So, in a way, they play with the children using their body, and um, through this use of the body, they can also approach the issue of the sexual education, which they have never experienced with their fathers. So, the large majority of the sample of the involved fathers um, they are very, very interested in playing games with their children. So they always, they always play games. And I would like to show you a quotation. So for example, look at this quotation. 
I do exactly the opposite of what my father has done with me. I don't know, I, I don't remember that my father has ever taken me in the shoulder a moment. Oh, sorry. What the hell is happening? <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Okay, the, this was the... Okay. So now I try. I also have fun with them, with the children. Or look at the second one. I, I, I don't think that my father has ever given a kiss to me. My son, I kiss him. Always and always and always. With my son, I launch him on the air and I catch him. Often it is him to say, enough, enough, stop that, stop that, stop that. So it's about playing with the body, playing with the body. So I believe it is important just to follow the example given by uh, Sarah. Sveva, excuse me, Sveva. And uh, to, to, to understand the point of view of, of the 30 mothers involved in the research. So, um, Marco proposes the, the, the word mammo, which means a, a male mother, okay? A male mother. Uh, there is a reason why my little daughter calls me mamo. Uh, this is a man, a father who is speaking. There is a, re a reason why my little daughter calls me mamo. I am a kind of second mother. You see that I've become a mother too. <coughs> and you see that my behavior at, at home is very similar to that of my, of my wife. Or take a look at this, at, at, at the last quotation. I feel myself quite complementary. We have reversed roles with respect to the parents. She works and I am, I am the housekeeper. So it's about, it's about turning upside down the, the gender roles uh, which are supposed to be performed by the, uh, the parents. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, this is another interesting quotation. I grew up, the relationship, okay, the third issue uh, investigated by Marco, the first one is the um, comparison between different models of fatherhood. The second one is the comparison between fathers and mothers. And the third one is the comparison between fathers and children. And I grew up, I grew up with the ways of my father who said, this is right, this is wrong, this is right, this is wrong. And today, I would, uh, it would be fair to say this is the rule, but there are exceptions. Okay, this is a very important point raised by Marco. Um, the word is not composed by uh, good and good things and bad things, but there are good things or bad things, but also there are exceptions. So we can discuss, and, and, and fathers discuss the rule with their children. Uh, it, it's a kind of negotiation between fathers and children about the rules. We have been must um, look at the second quotation. We have been educated not to give us so much fun. While, according to me, it would be correct make him understand that he was allowed to have fun. It is a very important thing that is part of the life. So, um, another dimension which is important to highlight is that the new fathers are teaching to their children how to have fun, okay? Because they, they are expecting that the mothers are not able 
to teach to their children how to have fun. So mothers do the uh, annoying domestic work and fathers perform the, 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 the game and the playtime with their children and through that they learn to the children how to have fun. So mothers are not able to learn to their children how to have fun. So to have fun is a male thing, okay? And uh, uh, going back to the emotional dimension of the involved father, um, an important point is about um, to be able to, to, to have a dialogue with the children. A dialogue which um, uh, sometimes takes the form of a, a, ne a negotiation, okay? I feel very, um, I would like to have a dialogue with them. I pose them some questions and I do this on a daily basis. So they are always, they, they are, I mean, the fathers are learning how to uh, talk with their children, how to negotiate with their children. And they do this every day on a daily basis. Once again, education and dialogue. So education is through dialogue. My son is confident, but first he's confident with the mother and then he's confident with me. So the mothers come first and then comes the father. Just give me 20 seconds. Okay, I think that this could be, okay, this is in, interesting because the paper ends up with the, uh, a sort of list of activities performed by fathers. So we have game and sport. <laughs> and uh, uh, to set and clear the table, to bring children to kindergarten or to the school. And to, to bring children to kindergarten means to, to, to play with them, of course. It's about playing with them. To dress, change and wash children. Bring them to bed, to sleep. Bring them to do the... Yeah, fare la spesa, thank you. Occasionally perform our activity as cooking. Occasionally perform cooking. Bring them to the doctor, taking care of their, of their health. To clean the house, uh, occasionally. Okay, to clean the house. So, I believe that um, this is what Marco would have said that the involvement of fathers in the uh, domestic work is a selective process. As you, as you can easily see from this slide, there are activities which are performed daily, and the most annoying activities are not performed daily, but only occasionally. So he found out that his research is quite on the same level of the available research about the involvement of fathers. And his conclusion is that he can prove from a qualitative research that the change lies more in the emotional and affective dimension than in education and mostly that the routine assistant is avoided just like Zveva was trying to explain to us uh, 10 minutes ago. So uh, this sample in using uh, Zveva words would be composed by uh, minister of, ministers of leisure, mostly ministers of leisure. Thank you.
and I, I'm sorry for the bad performance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we don't have a lot of time because we start late. Uh, if you want, we can collect all the questions and you prefer and you answer later. If there are questions, comments, we can collect. There are two. We have microphone. Okay. Four. Five. Para el italiano. C'è una domanda anche per Sveva, per quella di... E per Marco anche. Sì. Eh, dopo sentire queste riflessioni, esempi sul cambiamento delle paternità, ho un dubbio sulla questione di chi ha in questi nuovi modelli di paternità eh, alla fine eh, l'esercizio de, dell'autorità, no? chi ha alla fine il potere nella famiglia, chi ha l'ultima parola, no? chi risolve i conflitti, no? perché per me è molto importante come si fa questa distribuzione del potere dentro la, la famiglia. No? E un'altra riflessione, dopo sentire queste idee sulla eh, cura, le funzioni di cura, come eh, c'è un cambiamento della mascolinità, eh, penso che alla fine il vero problema sia che no, non c'è una trasformazione de, dello spazio pubblico, possiamo parlare di una trasformazione del privato, ma alla fine, soprattutto se parliamo della crisi dello Stato sociale e come questa, questo ritorno alla famiglia, no? di queste funzioni di cura, no? alla fine continuiamo a parlare di un Stato maschio, possiamo dire, e non c'è veramente un cambiamento nel senso dell'uguaglianza di genere, no? soltanto gli uomini cominciano a sentire altre emozioni, altre funzioni, ma il potere continua ad essere lo stesso e si mancano gli stessi problemi dal punto di vista del genere. Thanks. It's a question for um, Sveva and for um, Marco. Um, you represent Marco. Um, have you in, or has it been included in the studies to look at the role of service providers? Service providers, let's say the under five clinics where you go for vaccinations, the crashes, um, and perhaps the traditions that the parents have instilled upon both parents, especially also on the mother. And I'm asking this in relation to my own experience where 30 years ago when I became a father, I was one of the few fathers to, be, to take my child to the under five clinic because I was, I was at home for the first eight months. And I was always the only father, but never a question asked, just a bit of surprise. Now, 30 years later, when I meet other new fathers who do the same thing, when they come into the vaccination clinic with a small child, on purpose being the father, active father, they get questioned, is your wife ill? Or um, when they're finished with all the vaccination and the weighing and all that, they give this letter to your wife. And these fathers are getting upset. They're actually saying, I'm the father. Why can't you give a letter to me? No, this is for your wife. Which means to me that in fact the earlier development 30 years ago was more positive to encouraging fathers to be active fathers. And today, related to the new staff that you find in Unified Five Clinics, and that's a difficult issue to discuss also because it's a new type of staff in these clinics, not being trained to accept fathers as fathers. So I'm just wondering whether it has been included because that is contributing to our active fathership or demotivating active fellowship. Hello. Yes, okay. Uh, I'm Anina Lubbock. Um, I'm not an academic. I'm, I would call myself an activist. I worked for 30 years in international aid working on gender equality issues. I've only recently come to deal with the issues in Italy. Um, now, a group of associations, including Maschile Plurale, associations that are mainly men-led, have created a network called Il Giardino dei Padri, a forum for, on paternity and parental care. And we are affiliated to the global fatherhood campaign Men Care, which some of you may, may be familiar with. Uh, which has this sort of triple agenda, so fatherhood, engaged fatherhood is important because it's good for gender equality. It's good for men because that involvement is, uh, is key to, being, to your being a human being. 
And it's essential for children because there's all this now, this big body of uh, evidence from research about the huge impact on the cognitive and emotional development of children of this early strong father involvement. The issue is, the question I have is really what are the levers for change? This isn't at all easy. Um, I mean, Italy is quite specific. Uh, I think Marco's analysis is very uh, appropriate. I would say that a large number of Italian fathers fit into Zveva's last category, <laughs> regrettably, although we'd love them to be in number one. <laughs> uh, so how do you bring that change about? Frankly, we don't see men rushing to take on care, I mean, apart from the nicer parts of that. Uh, and I actually had a big argument with my son this morning and he says, oh, you feminists, you don't understand what's holding us back and you just tell us we must do this and we must do that and we're sick of it. You don't understand what difficulties we have. So really, you know, what are the levers uh, uh, to, to go from Zveva category four to Zveva category one? And it seems to me from the examples given that you've got aspects that, that are related to women's work, what kind of employment women have. I mean, if you've got a horribly boring job anyway, it's much more fun to look after your children. So it's, you know, the type of job that women, ha women have. Um, I, it depends on, uh, largely on the, on the couple relationship. Um, it depends on education of men, I mean, how they've been brought up, but also the kind of exposure they have, you know, groups, how they can be in groups with other men, and the kind of social pressures that there are to conform to certain model of fatherhood. I would say that this model of engaged fatherhood is not very strong in Italy. I know that there are countries that have had national fatherhood campaigns in which this model has been uh, promoted. And this, regrettably, this hasn't yet happened in Italy. But I think it also depends on legislation. Um, we, in Italy, we have this problem at the moment. We only have two days of paternal leave. Uh, now this is going to be brought to five, which is not going to make a great big difference. However, uh, what you read everywhere is that whether the paternal care is two days or five days or ten days, it's nevertheless important but it, because it makes men aware and often aware of actually how nice it can be. I mean, a big burden and difficult, but also how enjoyable and pleasurable it is. So my question is, given all this wonderful analysis that we've had, what are the levers of change? Any other questions? I'll go with Stephanie first. Buongiorno. Um, Vorrei fare tre, tre osservazioni e domande un po' su tutti e tre gli interventi. Il primo mi pare che sia necessario eh, non limitarci all'osservazione all dei ruoli o delle attività svolte, ma più a una dimensione anche un po' più profonda del nesso tra maschilità e cura. Quindi non solo quali ruoli o quali attività svolgi, ma quanto la costruzione della maschilità si basi su due elementi su cui abbiamo parlato anche ieri, un modello di uomo che si emancipa dalla relazione e quindi la relazione è vissuta come luogo diciamo, problematico per la propria identità e l'uomo che si emancipa dalla corporeità e quindi dall'uso del corpo nelle relazioni. Io credo che se non guardiamo a questa dimensione più profonda ci limitiamo solo a vedere uomini che sono più o meno disponibili ad assumersi incarichi faticosi o noiosi eh, senza andare alla dimensione diciamo profonda. Non a caso mi sembrava eh, nell'intervento sia di Dolos che di Sveva eh, ci fosse un, una domanda, gli uomini sono abili alla cura, sono capaci di prendersi cura, hanno le competenze affettive, emozionali e corporee per farlo? Quindi non solo sono disponibili, ma quanto sono capaci a farlo. No? E, 
e credo che questo significhi eh, che non possiamo semplicemente chiedere agli uomini di assumersi un carico, ma dobbiamo cambiare un simbolico su cui gli uomini costruiscono la propria corporeità e la propria relazionalità. E questo mi sembra che è quello che manca. Se, come diceva Sveva, l'uomo che si prende cura viene chiamato mammo, vuol dire che continuiamo ad attribuire simbolicamente la funzione relazionale, affettiva, eccetera, al femminile e l'uomo che l'assume è un uomo femminilizzato, mammizzato, se possiamo dire così, no? ma non riusciamo a pensare a una specifica competenza maschile nella cura che trovi nel corpo maschile la risorsa per la cura e non nella femminilizzazione di questo corpo. Quindi credo che il problema non sia eh, semplicemente quali incarichi sono più noiosi e quali più gratificanti, perché gli uomini hanno anche molti incarichi forse noiosi nella propria attività maschile che si assumono perché simbolicamente quel ruolo noioso li conferma nella loro maschilità. Quindi non è perché sono degli scansafatiche che non vogliono lavare il bagno e invece vogliono fare un'altra cosa, no, vanno in miniera perché quello gli conferma la loro maschilità. La seconda domanda è se noi guardiamo ai rapporti tra donne e uomini nella cura, rompendo col binarismo della complementarietà tra i sessi, donne accudenti, uomini protettivi o altro, e quindi non ad attitudini femminili, questo vuol dire anche mettere in discussione la femminilità e quindi ad esempio mettere in discussione il potere dell'indispensabilità della cura, no? il potere della centralità della cura, donne preoccupate perché l'uomo non sarà capace di svolgere quell'attività o donne che, eh, come dire, mi sembrava lo dicesse Sveva forse, donne che forse devono fare anche i conti con la ferita per la rottura di quella loro potente centralità nella relazione di cura e quindi questo chiede anche uno spostamento affettivo e simbolico delle donne in questo processo di cambiamento e quindi anche nella relazione con i figli questo secondo me porta a, una, a quella la, la questione che diceva Nina Lubok su cui io non sono del tutto d'accordo cioè io credo che sia per questo motivo arretrato, insufficiente fare appello alla funzione paterna, cioè alla necessità della funzione paterna e a una, un, un approccio tutto normativo legato all'aspetto all legislativo per farlo dire i figli hanno bisogno della figura del padre rischia di riportarci all'idea che i figli hanno bisogno di un padre e di una madre, di due ruoli tra loro complementari e funzionali se i padri difendono la funzione paterna anziché reinventarsi l'esperienza paterna non facciamo questo spostamento. We answer the question because we don't have uh, more time. Is you one very short or There are two. One here and Luca. You can answer. Any more questions? Can we take the post? Yeah, but yes. very short, please. Okay, then I will just uh, limit my observa to one observation. Um, as, a, as a gay man, I've been uh, usually the carer in the, in the couple. Um, as a member of an heterosexual kinship, I've been asked by the network of women to take a male role in the care of uh, uh, parents, in particular my mother, and uh, in the care of uh, Um, children uh, of my sisters or cousins. Uh, so um, just an observation that uh, in part the, the choices of men in the way they care are linked to the, to the decisions of the female network because care is in the hand of the female network of the kinship. I would like to ask my question in, in Italian in order not to be misunderstood. Uh, Sveva, uh, io mi colloco tra il primo e il secondo modello di, di padri. Um, allora, due cose. Primo, quando dici che il papà e il figlio parlano di calcio, non puoi dire che è un tema impersonale. 
È un tema assolutamente personale, perché eh, tra papà e figlio, quando si parla di calcio, si scambiano molte cose che hanno a che fare con dimensioni molto intime e personali della propria crescita come maschio, credo però, eh, cioè è, è troppo semplice dire parliamo di calcio e possiamo parlare di tempo, possiamo... no, calcio è una cosa importante tra papà e figlio. Se, secondo, eh, sono molto stupito che nelle tue interviste eh, i papà, eh, che, che è un tema importante I, i, i padri che sono molto coinvolti nel lavoro domestico anche riprendendo quello che Stefano diceva non litighino a morte con le proprie compagne ma e litighino a morte sulla qualità del lavoro di cura Secondo, io credo che in questa dimensione qua il, il cambiamento passi assolutamente attraverso il conflitto e il conflitto non è tanto su tu fai io no tu, eh, ma il conflitto è su quello che tu fai, come lo fai. Per cui dovremmo cominciare a studiare anche il cambiamento negli standard che definiscono la cura.